G'day everyone and welcome back to this Share Cafe Hidden Gems webinar. Today we are discussing pain management, regenerative medicine, video analytics, technology, copper and gold. Never a dull moment and always informative. Now, if you'd like to ask a question, please type in the box provided. Try not to be anonymous because it's difficult. We don't have, if we don't have time for the question, we have no way of following up for you. We do send all these questions through to the CEOs if we don't have time to have them asked during the presentation. Okay, straight into it today, let's make a start. First up, we have pain check, ASX code PCK, market cap around 41 million. We have with us Philip Daffis, who is both the CEO and managing director. The company is transforming pain management by using facial recognition and artificial intelligence to detect pain. Philip, thanks for your time, over to you. Thank you, and look, thank you to everyone for this morning for, for being with me this morning. Um, my name is Philip Daffis. Just from some background, I'm, I've got a long history in medical device and diagnostics. Um, I have mean, leadership positions based in Europe, US, and Australia. I could work with Pfizer in their in their cardiovascular business back in Europe, with Roche Diagnostics based in Mannheim, Germany, in their diabetes monitoring business. And I joined Cochlear in the late 1990s, setting up their European business for, for about four years based out of London before coming over to Sydney to head up their global marketing. Um, Paincheck was listed in 2016, and I've been CEO and Managing Director since then. Next slide, please. So our mission is to give a voice to those people who can't reliably verbalize their pain. Now, for most people, in the majority of the population, who can self-report their pain, typically where they communicate a pain level of one to 10 um, and, 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 and communicate that and have that treated by their GP and doctor. So while most of the population can communicate and verbalize their pain, unfortunately, there are a large group of vulnerable people who can't do that. This includes on one extreme, those living with dementia and with cognitive impairments who may have lost their ability to communicate effectively and therefore are unable to reliably verbalize their pain. And the other extreme, there's very young children, pre-verbal children who've not yet built those communication skills. So our mission is to give a voice to those people who can't reliably verbalize their pain. Now, paper-based tools have been around for many years um, and, and they, they have been out there in the marketplace. Unfortunately, they're rarely used, they're difficult to use and they're highly subjective. What we have done is develop a digital version or a digital app that basically uses smart devices, artificial intelligence and camera-based technology to automatically assess the most com assess the most complex part of the of the patient pain assessment process, it just takes three seconds, and then includes other observational elements to complete the full pain assessment process within a matter of minutes. It's for use by nurses and carers, and provides critical information for better pain management. Next slide, please. These groups of people are, are, are pretty significant. There are, it's projected to be 150 million people living with dementia globally by 2050. Um, and this is a similar number of people to those living with diabetes. So it's a very significant number. People with dementia really triangulate their time between living at home, moving to an aged care facility, or, or being admitted into a hospital. And that more than a third of hospital beds are occupied by people with dementia at any one time. So these are three important markets. And as you will see, we've, been, we've penetrated both, all three of those markets to date with our adult product. The infant opportunity towards the adults is 400 million infants at any one time, pre-verbal infants living, um, living so pre-verbal children living at home with their mums and dads who obviously have not built up those communication skills. And so we see a big opportunity, not just in the healthcare environment, this technology, but also the consumer product in the home. Next slide, please. So in summary, we have two products, an adult product and an infant product and two market segments. We're selling both into the healthcare professional segments, um, which is obviously hospitals, care homes, GP sectors, and that's through a annual enterprise business to business license on the other side we, we're going to, to the home market as well that's either professional home carers such as those with home care packages or or direct to home consumers by use in the environment in their home environment as a normal app a, a b to b, b to c subscription license on a monthly basis so both models are working um, and that's as a, as a digital technology next slide please 
So some key achievements. These are really what we've, this is what's to summarize at the end of March this year. So we have more than 120,000 global licenses uh, contracted across more than 1,500 aged care facilities. We've got an ARR of about 1.5 million to date. Um, and that's going to, that's going to, going to transition to over $4 million in the next 12 months, when we've fully implemented and transitioned all these beds onto standard paycheck contracts. Our both our products are regulatory cleared for use in Australia, Europe, UK, New Zealand, Singapore, and Canada. And we're, we're in process for both in the United States. In fact, I was on a call with the FDA at midnight last night um, as we're going through our final clinical trial protocol with the FDA for the US market. And we've already made a decision that we can bring in the infant products into the US market this year as a clinical decision support tool. So that's happening already. Um, overseas, the UK market, in fact, doubled their beds in the last quarter. We've got a strong pipeline of opportunities in the UK, both direct sales and with our integration partners. We've also recently um, signed our first New Zealand agreement, which was done actually remotely. We've not been there. We couldn't travel there for obvious reasons. But we set up, we trained, we implemented, and we negotiated an agreement with Somerset Holdings for 1,200, 1200 beds. Sorry. They're the third largest aged care provider, um, covering 1,200 beds in New Zealand. We also now have first sales in hospital, in home care, um, and we've got patents granted in multiple markets. So very strong performance for the company overall. Next slide, please. So if you look at the Paycheck Universal app, um, the universal, the, the infant, so the adult app has now been on the market for a few years. And it's really evolved significantly since, since we first launched. It, it, what it does, it really brings pain assessment back to the point of care. It's a multi-dimensional pain assessment tool that gives information to the carers as to the pain severity levels, like the no pain, mild, moderate, or severe. <clears throat> and the technology is fully embedded into the app. In other words, you can use the technology and on a phone or a smart device anywhere at any time it does not have to be connected to the internet so it's very very flexible and very good for use in remote sectors we've also brought in the nrs the numeric rating scale which is a technology which, which allows us to assess and document pain for those who can verbalize and thus making it a universal technology and we have an analytics tool that really analyzes all the information it provides next slide please this shows you this shows you one example of, of our analytics and how 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 we how we see data. Um, data can be used by assessed by individuals. We can compare scores across the across multiple multiple people. Next slide, please. And we can also look at the assessments for the, for history from a historical perspective um, and look at and look at pain behaviours. Now, this type of data we provide to our aged care facilities have never been available before. It, it helps their accreditation purposes, and it also makes sure that anything they do can be used for, for better pain medication. Next slide, please. So if, as being a digital technology, we've, we've adapted all our training to be fully digital. So we've got both e-learning modules and classroom learning modules. And in, in the past couple of years, since COVID hit, we've done more than 8,000 trainings for people online and in that same period we've actually grown our pain assessments and we, we document every single pain assessment conducted as of as end of March we hit more than a million cumulative pain assessments which shows that the products being used extensively in aged care and I can tell you right now we're over the 1.3 million assessment mark so it, this is a rapid utility in use of the product as people find it really helpful to help better manage pain next slide please so we started in aged care because in aged care, that's where the problem for pain assessment said it's greatest. And as you've, been, as you've heard so far, we've, we've penetrated to the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and entering to Canada this year. Um, the aged care market is around a $350 million market globally, so that's a, a significant market. But we do see the future really being in the home care consumer sector. Um, as, as the number of people with dementia increases, the preferred model is to be at home, uh, and also governments are funding that and technology is moving it that way. So the, the home care market will significantly dwarf our current work in aged care, and that's where our focus is for the future. 
How are we achieving that? We're achieving that with, with partly for our integration partners. Our integration partners, we've got more than 20 of them now. And these are companies that provide care management systems. They provide medication management systems in these markets. They, our current partners cover more than close to, sorry, close to 500,000 aged care beds, um, which provides us a great, great platform to, to access these markets. So what does, what does integration do? First of all, it means that every single pain assessment conducted on pain check is automatically integrated into their care management systems, eliminating duplication of efforts and taking out all the manual paperwork. What it also now is starting to do is that these partners of ours are co-promoting, co-marketing and providing reseller agreements to actually sell our products into their markets and maximize the opportunity for both of us. So it's a, a real win-win situation and our, and our partnerships here continue to grow. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to move on to the Infant app, because the Infant app is, is really new. Um, it's the world's first automated AI-based pain assessment tool for infants. Um, our first version is for infants below the age of one, from one month to one year. And it's for, for assessing post-procedural pain. So key areas to focus on here is post-vaccination pain. There's more than all kids get about five vaccinations the first year of their life, and COVID-19 will be the sixth. It's just been regulatory cleared in the US uh, for infants at six months of age to have COVID-19 vaccination. And that will come to Australia in the next six months and Europe very rapidly soon. So this is one big area we see as an opportunity. The second area is post-operative. That's um, post in, in the emergency room where we're doing a study with Melbourne Children's Hospital right now and also Wesley Children's Hospital in the EMT departments for things like post tonsillectomy. So that's the professional area, but the big area, as I said before, is, is collaboration we see with global therapeutic companies. We have a number of good companies we're talking to right now, including Otis Sigma um, in Australia, to actually incorporate our pain assessment with their pain medication management for home use. So this is a really exciting high growth market opportunity. Next slide, please. If you look at the value, well, I said before, 400 million range between the age of zero to three, there's 140 million infants between zero to one. And if we could just get 1%, just 1% of that global market, that's over $300 million annualized. Um, and that's, 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 um, that's, a, that's a very significant marketplace. So, so uh, that's our key focus for the next six to 12 months is to really build that market opportunity. This is how we see it working broadly. Um, infant, you know, is, 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 has a procedure, either a post a vaccination or post surgical procedure. The GP or the doctor uh, conducts an assessment, a pain assessment with the, with the parents in place. The, the parents are educated in terms of pain management and education. The parent can then access pain check via our retail store or directly through the app store and continue to assess pain in the home environment. Very much like you do with taking a temperature or, or a person with diabetes would manage their blood glucose monitoring. So, you know, I, I work for Roche in, in the diabetes sector. That is now a $10 billion per annum business um, for, the, for, for, the, for the players in that market. And, and we're talking about similar numbers here within the children's sector. <clears throat> Finally, I just want to finish off on a couple of things. We recently, just this week, were given a grant from the WA government to develop a pro product pain check for children with disabilities. That's been collaborates, it's a collaboration with the University of WA um, and also and the Telephone Kids Institute. And so it just really gives further evidence that why there's a need for these technologies to assess not just pre-verbal children for their pain, but also non-verbal children and children with disabilities. So that's a very exciting project. And we will own the commercialization rights and the technology and the IP from this project. Finally, um, corporate summary, that's our, our, that's our market cap as of June, as of uh, June the 30th. Um, and our, our cash in the bank was 4.7 million. We've since done a successful, fully underwritten capital raise to raise up, which will give us another $4 million in capital and plus just received a million dollar R&D rebate. So that really takes us really strongly through now for the next 18, 24 months to allow us to complete all our core business goals. Next slide, please. Uh, so I'm going to finish on here. This is our investment highlights. So what I would say, you know, in, in summary, PainCheck is a large global market opportunity. 
We've validated our technology in Australia and now the UK. Um, and we should, so we should show that we can actually, we've proven we can internationalize the business. It's now all about expanding and entering to new larger markets, including North America and Europe. The technology is novel and we have a very strong team who can execute with, with great global experience. So let me hold it there for questions. Thanks, Philip. We've got time for a couple of questions. Um, what, what, what we saw, saw recently in Australia was we saw Pfizer launch a bid for Res app, which really kind of validates this um, mobile app as a kind of a, a, a medical uh, tool, for want of a better word. H how important is, is it for um, PainCheck to have these kind of integration partners and, and to potentially work with, with you know, big biotech, for example? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that was a very interesting move by Pfizer. I worked for Pfizer many years ago, and I can see how they, they would like to sort of use that technology for research, for example. That's good. Um, these partnerships are critical. Um, we have, say, more than 20 partnerships already um, with these care management systems, and it means our, our brand gets out there. They've <clears> recognised <throat> it. They've actually, they, they're supporting the use. They're actually buying from us now. Some are buying licenses from us and reselling onto their clients. Um, and, and, you know, we do have, and we have had a number of contacts with Big Pharma, um, and, you know, we're not looking to sell the company at this stage, um, but, you know, we, we, I think in comparison, we are on the market, we've got proven product, we've got proven usage, and I think actually we've got a much bigger market opportunity. So, so no, I, I mean, I could see us linking very nicely with Big Pharmaceuticals, especially for the internet app, um, and, and um, being, the, being a sort of a business model for the future. And, and of course, the aged care industry was hit pretty hard by COVID. Are there any kind of long-term structural changes within that industry that may play into pain check some business model? Oh, absolutely. That was a really good question. In fact, the, the new re requirements, new regulations um, that have been and, and funding from the government that's happening actually in October this year, uh, it makes pain assessment absolutely critical. Um, and obviously what we're providing our, our clients is not just the ability to assess pain, but to show through our analytics that they, they, they're doing it, they're doing it effectively, they're documenting it, and they're managing medication better. So, so we, we see ourselves as their partner, not just in pain assessment, but also in ensuring they can achieve their accreditation requirements and their, their government reporting requirements. Yeah, it certainly makes sense. And just one last question, Philip, who are, the, who are your competitors in this space? Well, that's an interesting factor. There's no, the competitors are really the old paper-based systems. The paper-based systems, you, uh, which is things like the Abbey Pain Scale that have been used for many, many years, but are quite complex to use. Now, the Abbey Pain Scale was developed by uh, a lady in South Australia, Jen Dr. Jennifer Abbey, who's actually a very good contact of ours. She's on our advisory board. And she's the first person to say, look, pain, she, her words, pain check is the evolution of the, the original work using modern technology, bringing pain assessment back to the points of care and allowing and allowing all carers, not just specialist carers in pain, but allowing all carers to, to, to do pain assessments and to treat their residents and their and their patients better. So um, we've also got patents, don't forget, we've got we've got we've we've, we've got patents granted in the US, um, China and Japan, and we're in process in Australia and, and Europe. So those patents will give us protection through to 2035 as well. Great, Philip. Uh, that's all we have time for, unfortunately. Enjoy your weekend and uh, we'll catch up with you again. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Next up, we have OrthoCell, ASX code OCC, market cap of around $74 million. We have with us uh, Paul Anderson, who is the managing director. The company is a world leading regenerative medicine company providing innovative products to restore mobility, function, and performance. Paul, over to you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, Tim. Thanks very much uh, to Share Cafe for the opportunity and uh, thank you for your uh, kind attendance uh, today. Um, <clears throat> really just wanted to give you um, some insights into who OrthoCell is and what the innovative products that we have developed and are now taking to market. And also to give you an understanding of the opportunity that lies ahead for investors in this undervalued stock. So um, uh, just want to give you an upside on that, uh, on the, the uh, OrthoCell story. So next slide, please. And next slide, please. So just want to give you some background and some of the key investment highlights. We work in the regenerative medicine space um, and we're delivering breakthrough um, products for the treatment of what is called serious musculoskeletal disorders. 
musculoskeletal meaning bone, nerve, tendon, muscle. This is the framework that holds our body together. And as we age, uh, that framework also ages. Um, and, and as a result, there's a, a, a some great opportunities and unmet clinical needs, particularly in the areas of nerve, bone and tendon repair, uh, which is our company's focus. Um, the portfolio that we have within the company, and I'll, I'll show you that as we go through the presentation, um, has significant cl clinical evidence. Um, and some of those products now approved in major uh, markets around the globe. And I'll, I'll talk to more detail about that. Um, but really returning patients to work, uh, to sport and to recreation in a pain-free way to improve their activities of daily living. Very importantly, OrthoCell uh, is a manufacturer of its products. We manufacture these products here in Australia from Australian raw material. Uh, we are TGA licensed. We have uh, ISO accreditation, uh, which it goes along with our EU and our FDA approvals. So that enables us to manufacture from this country to distribute globally, which I think is a a, a, a great piece of net national benefit for this company, not the company and the country. Uh, and I think you'll see that as we go through this presentation. Uh, we have a comprehensive global patent portfolio with over 85 patents delivered internationally from six different patent families uh, that involves our products. Uh, and so very pleased with the development of that with the intellectual property originally coming from the University of Western Australia uh, here in, in, in Western Australia. Uh, and lastly, we have a highly experienced board. We have board members in the US, uh, in, in, in Lund, in Sweden, uh, in, in China, uh, uh, Australia, and, and, uh, and as I mentioned, the US. So a really experienced board that really represent the skill sets that are required now to take us to that next level with regards to reimbursement expertise and, uh, and commercial expertise. Uh, and so a fantastic board. We have uh, about 190 million shares on offer. Uh, as I mentioned, a 75 or 70, depending on what day you're, you're looking, uh, between 75 and $80 million market cap. Um, we have, as I mentioned, a very experienced board uh, and $32 million uh, in cash as of the 5th of July, uh, 22, um, which has been recently bolstered by a, uh, an exclusive license and, uh, uh, and distribution agreement that we've completed and I'll talk in more detail about that um, as it's a fairly rare event in the Australian medical device space. Next slide please. So what are the products that we've developed? Uh, essentially two broad portfolios and the first is a platform. It's called the um, uh, Cellgrow platform. It's, it's a medical device uh, of biological nature. It's designed to augment the surgical repair of bone, nerve and tendon tissue. Um, our first application in market is for dental uh, uh, products, for guided bone regeneration. Uh, and we have now our nerve product is approved in Australia, just recently approved by the Therapeutic Goods Administration and now driving that product into the US as well. Um, we've demonstrated some very superior, clear performance data here. And so we know that this is a, a clinically proven uh, set of products um, and really approaching, and as I'll demonstrate through the presentation, some really important um, milestones that we've just recently achieved and, and are now approaching also. Uh, um, and then secondly, in our portfolio, uh, we've developed a cellular therapeutic, and this goes along with um, our medical device in that some tissue requires medical devices of biological nature to heal. Some tissues require a cellular interaction to make them heal and some tissues require a combination of those two and hence we've developed a dual portfolio firstly focused on uh, a collagen medical device and then secondly on our cellular therapy for the regeneration of human tendon tissue these are huge markets over 700,000 patients per year in the us suffer from tendon tendinopathy issues within their shoulder and this technology is the first injectable clinical stage cellular therapy for the treatment of tendon injuries uh, globally in, 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 in uh, this space. And it's addressing a significantly unmet clinical need. And we've gone through randomised studies, um, which um, uh, we've recently reported, uh, and we're now well and truly on our way into the US FDA and to the Australian market. So very excited about the potential of that product in this unmet clinical need. Uh, and essentially what we're about is restoring mobility and function as we get these degenerate chronic injuries as we, as we move through the age brackets. Next slide, please. 
So where are we at from a US strategic focus? I'm delighted to let you know that Striat Plus, which is for our dental regeneration, I'll show you some more detail around that in a moment, dental bone regeneration. We now have FDA approval, we have EU approval and Australian approval, and we've recently engaged with an exclusive distribution and license partner um, called BioHorizons, one of the largest companies in the world in the dental space, and I'll talk more to that in the next couple of slides. Replier is for our um, uh, a nerve repair. Uh, we've recently had that product approved by the Therapeutic Goods Administration here in Australia and are now driving that through both um, uh, uh, the US FDA uh, and European um, uh, market entry points. Uh, we also have a very exciting pipeline product called, um, which is called Smart Rope. And that's where we're converting our collagen medical device into a collagen rope at four millimetres in thickness can lift me off the ground. Uh, well, it certainly could six months ago anyway, it might not today, but uh, it certainly lift us off the ground. Um, and so what that says is that it's got incredible tensile strength. It is of a highly uh, conductive biological nature and is going to be used for the replacement of ligaments such as the anterior cruciate ligament uh, in, in, in the knee. And so that's a really exciting pipeline product. And as mentioned with our ATI, our cellular therapy for the regeneration of human tendon tissue, we've recently completed a randomised clinical study which has formed a foundation for us to drive that product into the US market. And, and, and the second indication in that product is for the elbow or what's known as tennis elbow. And it sounds like a flippant injury, but it actually has devastating effects once it moves into that chronic, that chronic space. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so now I just wanted to give you some insights into Remplier. Um, what's the problem that with, with, with ruptured, severed or damaged nerves today is that the most common way of joining those nerves back together is with a needle and thread. That needle and thread does damage to the nerve. It impedes its ability to have a predictable outcome. And so the product we've developed not only uh, enables the surgeon to join those two nerves together without using sutures or minimising the use to one or two sutures, it also provides a bioactive chamber for that nerve to heal in a bit in a more rapid way. It also mimics the epineurum, the outside edge of the nerve. And so we've created a product that supports the healing mechanism, that protects it from the outside, it's a barrier, but also um, it provides a bioactive chamber for these nerves to grow in a more predictable and a consistent way. And that's really the holy grail for surgical interventions for it to be able to return function to paralyzed limbs in a predictable way with a product that has proven biocompatibility, that has exceptional handling qualities and provides this really unique healing environment. So keep an eye out for this product. It's been approved now in Australia. We're starting to make some real inroads into the market here and extremely excited about our pathway into the US market, the world's largest healthcare market, where there's over 700,000 peripheral nerves that are treated every year using a needle and thread. So fantastic opportunity for this product. Next slide, please. And why are we so excited about this patient? Where uh, this, this patient group and this product is because the clinical data that we've produced here in Australia uh, for these peripheral nerves and quadriplegic patients have, has been quite stunning. And what we've seen here with patients who have got paralyzed limbs, we've been able to conduct using our product, this advanced surgical technique called nerve transfer, where we're taking nerves or, 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 or wires from other areas of the body that aren't affected and we're splicing them back into paralyzed limbs. And what we're seeing is quite a foundational, fundamental change in their abilities. And we're seeing um, at 24 months, a, a predictable, uh, and, and a consistent return of voluntary muscle movement and function to 85% at two years. And we're talking about quadriplegic patients that previously were unable to walk, uh, sorry, to, to, to wheelchair, uh, to use their wheelchair, uh, unable to, to shift themselves from their bed to their chair, unable to toilet themselves, and, and unable to even use their devices or, 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 or hug or, or, or um, have interactions with their children. So what this technology and this surgery has done with incredibly brave patients has drive them forward into um, a much better place. Next slide, please. Uh, and again, huge markets, which I've already mentioned here. So um, next slide, please. 
I want to briefly talk about Strayat Plus, our, 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 our product for dental uh, repair. It's a product that's used to augment bone repair. Every single bone uh, implant, dental implant that's put into place requires a, a bone graft and it requires a membrane of this nature. And so we've developed an incredible product that's now taking some significant steps forward in the US. And as a result of that, next slide, please. We have recently announced to the market a, um, a, a deal that we've just signed with, um, with BioHorizons, one of the largest dental companies in the world, uh, for a global exclusive license and manufacturing agreement with our company. We now have a wonderful partner with Global Reach, um, and that value to us is a 20 $3.1 million exclusive upfront license and distribution fee, non-diluting capital into the company at a, at a time which I can which which I know all involved in the stock stock markets know any undiluted um, um, uh, uh, capital at this stage is gold. So we're delighted to announce this um, a relationship and agreement uh, with the company, but it enables us to continue to manufacture for our partner and continue to have that net national, net, net national benefit, as I mentioned. Next slide, please. Um, in conclusion, just a couple of slides to go. I really want to draw your, um, your attention to these comparators. Um, at, if you look at Avita and Polynova at a very similar stage to our company, uh, at a very similar clinical stage, they were very similar market caps. And so we see that both Avita and particularly Polynova a wonderful comparators for this company. So you can really begin to see the opportunities that lie with this stock OCC. Next slide, please. And so upcoming catalysts, uh, we have engaged with that um, marketing and distribution partner in the US, which is a fundamental piece, uh, not in the just in the co company's future, but in that product future. Uh, Replan now approved in Australia and starting to take market share and driving through our FDA pre-submission process. And also ATI now recently completed randomised clinical studies at a level two study, a level one study, apologies, at the highest level. So some very exciting times ahead for this for the company, some, some great value and opportunities uh, and a great time to invest in, in, in all cells. So thank you very much for the opportunity today and thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Paul. Um, really fascinating products there. Now, it, it does look like you're... You're cheap relative to your peers. You've got a big cash backing, 32 million, I think, against market cap of kind of 70 million, 72 million. What, what's the market missing, do you think? Yeah, so this has been somewhat of a complex story. Um, hmm. Regenerative medicine is a, is a reasonably hard story to articulate. We've got multiple products, both cellular and from a scaffold perspective. But it's our belief now that with this um, global partnering deal. This is not a company that's going to do things. This is not a company that's telling the market that we have something with potential. This validates our platform. That deal validates the platform across the board for nerve, bone, and our tendon applications. It's a validation that we are a manufacturer of quality. It is a validation that we have products of quality that can attract global partners for large upfront deals. And so, um, you know, we'll be articulating that to the market as soon as the school holidays are finished and we're out there um, treating the boards, telling the story about this wonderful deal that we've just done. So I think the market is about to have this story and run with it in, in, with some, some, some degree of gusto. And, and does that uh, Buyer Horizon deal, um... Uh, is there ongoing royalties or was it just a one-off payment? There's a question. No, so so we're, we're, we're continuing to manufacture for them. Um, those those um, uh, specifics are commercial and confidence, but I can tell you that we're going to, we're continuing to, to, um, to manufacture for them. That will continue to grow the revenues in the company and is a really important part of our, our business moving forward. And importantly, not only does this deal benefit us from our bone perspective, but also reduces our cost of goods for our nerve and tendon products. This is a portfolio play and enables us now to validate, scale up and become a mature manufacturer for future deals that we do in this space. And, and Paul, we're almost out of time, but can you give us a little bit more colour on the revenue model? Do you, do you sell the product? How, how does it work in terms of distribution and sales? Yeah, so we we are essentially not a dental company, but we've produced some really neat dental products. And so we want to partner into that market. 
um, and we've in, into those markets, and we've done that with Bio Horizons. From a nerve perspective, we see fantastic growth potential here for that product, and we want to maintain control over that product um, for some time to come until we move into the, the FDA. But fundamentally, we're about finding the right partners that can access the markets on our behalf and of the, the right quality. So it's not our intention to develop a sales force across the US. We will partner into those markets. Great, Paul. That's all we have time for. Fascinating story. Love to help tell that story moving forward. Uh, congratulations and have a nice weekend. It's my pleasure and thanks very much for your time. Excellent. Thank you. Next up, we have Istana, ASX code, of course, ICE. Market cap around $3 million. We have with us Matt McFarlane, who is both the CEO and Managing Director. The company is a global SaaS software company providing video analytic technology designed to identify abnormal events and unexpected behaviour for large-scale surveillance networks. Matt, thanks for your time. Over to you. Thanks for having me, Tim. It's really great to be here. and I love the title, Hidden Gems. It's, uh, it's nice to be one of the people featured today. Um, I'll take you through Isotana's video analytics surveillance uh, software uh, capabilities over the next uh, 10 minutes or so. So there's plenty of time for questions. Uh, please flick to the next slide, which is uh, one we won't spend any time on, but I needed to make sure it was included. So let's talk a little bit about the, the industry that we play in. So you probably, if you walk to work today, not many people do anymore after COVID, but if you did walk to work today, you probably walk past anything between 20 to 50 surveillance cameras. There's currently over a billion surveillance cameras globally and it's growing at 16% per annum. Uh, it's a, an astoundingly fast growing uh, sector. And the vast bulk, if you go to the next slide, the vast bulk of those cameras <clears throat> are not actively surveilled at all. Sorry, next slide, please. So people are not looking at what's going on in those cameras. They're used for recording. And you will see on the news reports, people you know, wading through forensic footage and trying to track down who did what to whom um, over, the, over the surveillance networks. However, AI technology has dramatically changed the perspective of security operations uh, professionals, uh, facility managers, the, the persons who manage these networks are increasingly seeing opportunities for um, the computer vision to start to scale up uh, the value that you can accrue from these very expensive surveillance networks that you've rolled out. There's net, you know, the network facilities, the cameras, et cetera. You go to the next slide, please. The technology now has come ahead leaps and bounds. We are getting releases from a product called YOLO, which uh, stands for You Only Look Once, uh, computer vision technology. It's, it's being released like every two or three months as a new update to it. It is unimaginable five or six years ago that you could have this many people in a scene all having boxes drawn around them. There's probably anything between 60 to 80 of these hundreds of people being uh, specifically identified by uh, the software in this particular view of Trafalgar Square. That gives you an idea of um, where this technology is going. And Isotana is absolutely on the cutting edge of the, of the technology. And we've built an incredible team who are building uh, some really, really cool products to specifically serve the surveillance industry. Can you go to the next slide, please? The physical security space is a large and growing um, sector. Uh, at the top level, you're talking about guarding services, uh, response systems, uh, alarms that go off when people kick doors down, access control, et cetera. Uh, within that sector, there's also surveillance, which is your cameras, control rooms, uh, video management systems, et cetera. And where Isotana sits is in the standalone surveillance analytics, where we are purely a software company. We don't manufacture cameras or hardware or anything like that, but we, um, we build the software that takes these video streams, uh, extracts data from them, and then we utilize that data using AI systems to be able to identify unusual and anomalous events. We go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Quick snapshot of the company. So we've been around for um, over 12 years now. We have 55 customer sites around the world with over 15,000 cameras every day using Isotana to identify these events. We're a very lean team of just 16 FTE, um, but active on five different continents. The past two years, June 20 to June 22, we've achieved 40% per annum uh, annualized recurring revenue growth. And that's our key 
uh, financial metric is recurring revenue. We are a software as a service company. And like other software as a service companies, we don't offer our service as a cloud-based offering. So we're not the kind of classic, uh, you know, I pay, I connect through the, through the internet to connect things. And one of the reasons for that is there's a huge amount of data produced by a typical surveillance camera. And um, it's extremely expensive to stream that up even with the uh, high-speed NBN type connections you see today in Australia and in other parts of the world. If you go to the next slide, please. So just to, to talk about how we differentiate ourselves when we're pitching to prospective customers. This is a large and busy space, as you would expect with a billion cameras out there and people charging on a per camera basis. Almost all of our competitors use a rules-based approach to um, giving solutions to their customers. A rules-based approach means that you are essentially building a product that says, if this, then that. So for example, if this face matches my facial recognition database, give me an alert and an alarm. Or if somebody crosses over this virtual tripwire that I've drawn on the screen, let me know about this type of thing. <clears throat> At Isotana, we have a very different approach. We are kind of like, I think a bit like Apple, you know, when the first Apple iPhone came out and only had one button and everyone was like, oh my God, how can I use this? It's only got one button. It, we, we drive towards simplification. And Isotana is all about no settings having to be set by the customer at all. You implement the system. It trains within a day, starts learning what's normal in front of the camera. And then having created a model of understanding of what's going on in, in front of the camera, it starts to pop up interesting and anomalous events. Typically, we are reporting um, anything up to maximum 2% of surveilled time. And we use a black screen interface, which you can see at the bottom right of this screen, where events fade in and fade out. If you're a security operator sitting in a control room, and some of the control rooms we work with are extremely large, um, you can literally fall asleep within about 15 to 20 minutes looking at a, a moving wallpaper and lo of lots and lots of images. What Isotana does is it removes all that moving wallpaper, it presents a blank screen, and when events happen, it could be any camera on their network, we pop it up, we fade in, we fade out, and these pops, as, the, as our customers call them, allow them to catch as their eye, lets the human brain do an assessment of whether that event is something that they need to respond to or not, and it starts to catch things that go far beyond basic rules, beyond the things that you might imagine or, or decide that you specifically want to find, and you start seeing things that you had no idea were happening in front of your cameras. And this is a very easy pitch to put to our customers because they like the idea of uh, a low touch implementation. They like the idea that their operators are being far more engaged, and they like the idea of finding these events in real time. If we could go to the next slide, please. I'm going to take you through a very brief case study. One of our most successful sectors has been the shopping mall sector. We have over 30 shopping malls using Isotana uh, globally at the moment. And um, if we think about a typical high-end uh, shopping centre environment, there might be, say, 200 cameras in a large shopping mall. There'll be a, a single control room with one operator in there. And at any point in time, there might be five guards on duty, anywhere from the, cent uh, the entrances to where the taxi Uber rank is to wandering about um, the, the centre. The cost for uh, just for the salaries of those uh, security staff can run up to 270 odd thousand a year. And things still happen, right? You might have people coming in doing unscheduled maintenance, damaging the uh, facilities. You can have aggressive behaviour taking place, uh, people falling down escalators, illegal calls, that type of thing, graffiti outside the facility. Please head to the next slide. When Isotana is implemented in this particular environment, we dramatically scale up the ability for the security operator in the control room to be able to identify events as they're happening to the extent that we consistently find that our customers can reduce the headcount of guards out in the field and they can nip in the bud potential uh, events like um, uh, unscheduled maintenance causing damage or aggressive behaviour escalating and, and resulting in um, you know, actual problems happening. All of these things add up to a more than 300% investment return for our customers. So we're not just about finding events, we're also about saving on recurring operational costs. And this is how Isotana has dramatically changed its pitch in the last year or so. Next slide, please. All right, so over the next quarter, we will be enhancing our um, offerings, particularly for the guarding services sector, where we offer an um, incredible value add, uh, scaling up our capabilities. And we're launching our new version two product, which, um, which takes advantage of many of the new contemporary um, technologies, such as that YOLO 
uh, product that I mentioned earlier, integrating that into our offering, but staying true to our vision of being very low touch, um, very, very quickly uh, delivering value to our customers when we implement. And uh, if we go to the next slide, please. The team is a, a, is a critical part of any investment. I've been a venture capital investor before I got in, on board as the CEO of Isatana uh, and a quite successful angel investor as well. Uh, my, my key role as the CEO is to attract an incredible team and have that team highly motivated and delivering to goals. Uh, Kevin Brown, our Chief Operating Officer, has joined us from VGW, Virtual Gaming Worlds. That's a multi-billion dollar business based out of Perth. Uh, Kev was the COO at that business and turned them around from $300 a day of turnover to $1.4 million a day. They're doing a lot more than that uh, now. He has brought on board some uh, amazing technical staff and he's one of those unique characters who can connect between commercial requirements and technical capabilities and find solutions uh, really, really fast. And my CFO, Raf Kimberly Bowen, has um, a, a long history of working in the software space uh, and, and has been an incredible addition to the team over the last 18 months or so. If you go to the next slide, please. This is uh, almost my last slide, in fact. So just a quick snapshot. I am definitely the minnow of the four presentations today. Our market cap as of yesterday was about just over 3 million. Uh, today we've popped up a bit, so um, I think we're at 4.2 odd million. So uh, don't feel like you've missed the boat because the interesting thing is um, Isatana's software as a service business with our annualized recurring revenue exceeds $1.5 million uh, this year. Uh, that's revenue that we very successfully retain with our customers and grow every year. Uh, we've managed a 40% growth rate over the last two years. And um, we're pretty excited about the future going forward with this new product. Um, uh, the, the multiples applied to our to our stock are incredibly low compared to global SaaS comparisons. So I think it's a great time to buy. So that's about it from me. Tim, over to you for questions. Thanks, Matt. Uh, so it certainly looks cheap there in regards to your cash balance and uh, market cap. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about this kind of revenue pipeline and how you acquire customers? Sure. So we've increasingly started using um, direct sales uh, techniques with outbound calls to line up meetings where we get to pitch the product directly to the customers that uh, are most interested in it. These tend to be uh, security managers and large facility managers, as well as the people who are managing uh, those control rooms that in the industry are called SOCs or security operations centers. Uh, we've found this very, very successful in the last uh, three to six months. So our pipeline's grown quite dramatically. And we've been testing this all in Australia. We do treat Australia as a bit of a test market for us. Uh, most of our revenue actually comes from the Middle East, uh, but we're seeing enormous opportunities growing out of Japan, uh, some in Singapore, and, and surprisingly, uh, perhaps surprisingly, in, in Latin America, where uh, the surveillance systems there are very actively monitored. I mean, and how do you monitor these opportunities offshore and kind of, are there any particular geographic sort of territories that you see the kind of the greater potential? We like to work with partners uh, in, in market. We've got a very strong partner in Japan in, in the form of Magnica uh, and in uh, Latin America, we're working together with NEC and some other partners. Um, in the Middle East, we've got a direct sales office, so our own Dubai facility. But again, we work through distribution uh, partners. So in the software industry, they used to be called uh, systems integrators. In the surveillance industry, it tends to be security integrators. And those types of uh, parties are very, very crucial to our distribution capability. We sign up one of their customers, their customers rave about the product. Those security integrators then go pitch it to other customers and we get, we get growth uh, of multi, multi-factorial growth, let's say, from that type of channel uh, management. And, and what is the actual subscription model? How does that work? So we typically charge on a per camera per year basis. Uh, uh, ballpark pricing is around about 120 US dollars per camera per year. So globally with the uh, Aussie dollar uh, slipping a bit, it's helped us in terms of our revenue uh, forecast going forward. Um, and you know, given the number of cameras that are out there, uh, average contract value is anything between sort of $40,000 to $80,000 uh, per annum recurring. And, and some of the, uh, you know, the local governments have cameras all around Sydney, for example, are they potentially a client or is there no one kind of sitting back there observing those cameras? Well, this is what's changed in the last couple of years. So historically, nobody was watching those cameras. They were, you know, there was a lot of time was spent pulling out the footage after the event had taken place. 
Uh, they do use these control rooms for instant response. So if they hear from the police that, you know, something's going off down a particular street, they'll train the cameras in that particular area. Uh, but there is an increasing movement from the forward thinking councils and from, uh, you know, smart city surveillance uh, folks that we can use AI and we can do this a lot better and we can nip things in the bud before they escalate. We can find out stuff that we might have missed in the past and we can respond much more rapidly. And that's been super exciting for us. So a number of the pitches that I've done in the last uh, couple of months have actually been to councils um, who have surprisingly large surveillance networks. You know, we're talking tens of thousands of cameras across uh, individual suburbs within Sydney, for example. I mean, it's one thing having a surveillance camera, but is there almost an obligation for these governments and, and corporates, for example, to, to um, observe a little bit more from these cameras and to take your sort of information and data? That's a, it's an interesting point. Historically, no, like historically, the, the, there hasn't been an obligation to actively uh, monitor, uh, but there is a, a court case in, in Canada and Calgary where the Calgary Council got sued because a gentleman was, he saw the surveillance camera, he was being chased, he ran up in front of it, waved his arms back and forth and said, help, help, I need help. And he ended up, ended up getting mugged directly in front of the camera and he sued the council and said, guys, you know, you told me, you told me I'd be safer with this surveillance and there I was literally waving to you and you never spotted it and they, and they they had to pay out on that so it's a it's an interesting development i think and if um once you once you see what isotana can do it's very hard to unsee it yeah yeah well it almost becomes an obligation right um and, and finally just quickly who's the ideal client base um for isotana so look my favorite pitches are always to companies who are in the guarding services space if, if we are pitching to somebody who provides uh, remote monitoring services to uh, multiple clients, you get very large camera counts and you get really strong um, value propositions where they can scale up their, their surveillance capability and they have challenges recruiting and retaining security operators to work in these control rooms. We make their jobs far more exciting. It's like putting in front of a, a customer a Where's Wally book because suddenly they start saying things that are really interesting <laughs> and they engage their brain uh, it's a lot more fun. Um, there's a few questions that have come through I saw on the Q&A. Do you want me to have Yeah, Yeah, if you, if you don't mind, we're out of time, but if you could answer those questions online, that'd be appreciated. Yeah, so really quickly on public transport, trains and trams, it is an interesting space for us. We have done trials in the past and we've got a couple of leads in the pipeline where we're working on that. We have worked with uh, Melbourne Metro in the past and did some uh, really good work for them. Uh, it is an interesting space for us, but again, it's not as actively monitored as you might think. Um, in terms of uh, costs and runway uh, for on the cash flow and cash positive status, um, our, our current business plan looks to towards us becoming cash flow positive towards the end of uh, this this current financial year. Um, so we don't we haven't forecast any capital raise requirements. But that does rely on us growing revenues, and um, <clears throat> and we do get a nice R and D tax rebate every year. So I'm I'm quite comfortable with our cash position right now. Great, man. That's all we have time for. Fascinating story. Love to hear it again later on in the year. Thanks again. Thanks very much. See you later. See you later. Uh, next up, we have Los Cerros, uh, ASX code LCL, market cap of around $19 million. We have Jason Sturbinski with us, who is the managing director. The company is committed to exploring, developing and operating mining projects with, within world-class mineral provinces with a focus on copper and gold. Jason, over to you. Thanks, mate. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> so yeah, Los Cerros is focused in uh, Colombia. Um, we're focused on the mid coca porphyry belt. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, it's it's an area that has a, has a lot of significant discoveries, and I'll show you that on a, on a map shortly. On this slide, the only two things I really want to draw your attention to is the EV per resource ounce. Uh, it's incredibly low compared to our peers. And uh, for those of you who use EV per resource ounce as a, as a measure of investment opportunity, uh, hopefully you see that as a significant opportunity uh, for us. And the other point I want to raise here is in the shareholder base. You'll see there that we have uh, North American institutions at 10%. We raised uh, $20 million last year and uh, 10 million of that went to two tier one precious metal expert um, funds out of the, out of the US uh, for, for roughly 5% each. So we have that North American presence in the, um, in the share registry. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we sit on the mid-Colker porphyry belt. That's that yellow strip you can see on the map there. 
and hosted by or surrounded by many uh, multi-million ounce discoveries from uh, Buritika in the north, which is truly a once in a generation type discovery, an incredible discovery through to La Colossa in the south. And the area that we're in is uh, particularly uh, dense for, for discoveries. We have uh, two project areas, the Andes project and the Kinchia project. The Andes project is all very early stage, so I won't talk about that much. It's the Kinchia project that's seen the, the bulk of our attention uh, over the last few years. And that consists of 2.6 million ounce resource grading at a gram per tonne. And within that is the Miraflores uh, Reserve and the Definitive Feasibility Study. There's about 460,000 ounces of reserve sitting there. And more recently, we revealed the Tesserito resource, which depending on how you cut it, is, uh, is, is 1.3 million ounces at 0.81 is one way of cutting it. Um, and there's obviously a significant uh, opportunity in the Kinchia area and, of course, in the Andes area. The Andes area is nine times the size of the Kinchia area, but uh, very early stage. We're well funded. As I said, we raised 20 million last year. We still have around 14 million of that. So um, we're, we're in a strong position. And uh, we're very much part of the local community and part of the local economy. Uh, we're, we're 130 odd people at the moment. 128 of those are Colombian, so it's just myself and the CFO that are not. So we're very much entrenched in the in the local community and a very experienced uh, team. Next slide, please. So the main focus, as I said, is the Kinchia project. Uh, the area on that map there where you can see the soil dots, that's all our, our ground there. So most of that map is our properties. Uh, you can see Miraflores roughly central in the image there. That's an 840,000 ounce resource. And within that is the reserve that I mentioned mentioned before. About 800 metres away from that is Tesserito. That's the uh, at-surface porphyry uh, gold discovery that's been the bulk of our attention for the last two years. Uh, as I said, about 800 metres apart. And about two kilometres to the northwest is Dos Cabratas, which is a 460,000 ounce resource uh, sitting up there. You can see uh, just in the, the distribution of targets of interest for the company that there seems to be this... Um, North-South trend uh, defined by the Mamoto Fault Corridor. That seems to be a major uh, plumbing system for the gold, and, and we are very excited by the number of um, targets we have in the area uh, from Chuskal to the south, right up to Mericielo in the north. Uh, next slide, please. So this is kind of like our trophy slide. Uh, I put this in here just to show that uh, some of the drill intercepts we're getting in this Kinchia area, this three-kilometre um, radius area, particularly Tesserito and Miraflores, are globally significant intercepts, uh, 629 metres of 0.88 uh, starting on the surface. And if you look there, fourth one down, 320 metres at one and a half grams per tonne. And again, pretty much starting on the surface with 100 metres of that grading, two grams per tonne. They're incredibly um, good results for a porphyry. And what makes them even more spectacular, particularly for Tesserito, is that it starts on the surface. So a lot of these 200 plus gram meter intercepts that we've got, and we've got many of them, uh, pretty much start on surface, which is unheard of. Um, next slide, please. So let's uh, dive a little deeper into the Kinchia uh, mineral resource. It's made up of those three areas, Tesserito um, with uh, 1.3 million ounces at 0.81 using a 0.5 cutoff. Uh, there is another way of cutting that using a 0.25 gram per tonne cutoff, which obviously gives you more ounces. Uh, and Dos Cabratas, the, the um, 459,000 there, and the Miraflores reserve to give you a total of 2.6 million ounces at a gram per tonne. And the image there on the, on the right is the optimised pitch shell from which the 1.3 million ounces was generated. And within that is a starter pit. And I'll talk about that starter pit. Uh, in, in a minute, because that creates quite an interesting permutation for us. But what we're doing at the moment is uh, progressing through the early stages of a Kinchia-wide PEA, Preliminary Economic Assessment or, or Scoping Study, looking at all three, so Tesserito, Dos Cabratas and Miraflores, because they're all very close to each other. It begs the question, can, can a uh, hub and spoke model uh, work and, and capture all of this material? So that's part of the Kinchia PEA. And um, we're progressing through the early parts of the metallurgy on Tesserito right now, and I'll talk about that um, on the next slide. Next slide, please. So this is the Tesserito inferred resource. The one that um, I've used to contribute to the Kinchia wide resource is the one in yellow there, the um, 1.3 million ounces of 0.81. 
But as I said um, in a few slides back, what's unusual about Tesserito is the um, high-grade porphyry core actually daylights. It actually hits the surface, uh, which means we've got near-surface high-grade, and we've drilled through that many times. But that begs the question, do we actually have a high-grade potential starter pit within the larger um, operations? So we ran that exercise. We used an artificial cutoff of 0.8 grams per tonne. Obviously, material below 0.8 is, is potentially economical, but we used the 0.8 to um, artificially constrain the, the resource to this high-grade core that, that daylights. And what we got out of that was 540,000 ounces grading 1.23 grams per tonne. So that's really exciting and, and really um, you know, compelling because obviously the early years of any production scenario would exploit this high grade area and therefore offset the capital burden of building the plant in the first place and, and therefore giving more robust economics. What's also really interesting about this is that because we used a 0.8 cutoff to give the 540,000 ounces, that means the waste in this area is, in the most part, not waste. It's um, material between 0.25 and 0.8, or 0.5 and, and 0.8, which you would clearly not define as waste in an operating environment. You would stockpile that. So once you've um, broken the uh, the back of the of the um, capital costs, etc., in production, you would then start exploiting those stockpiles because all you need then is to off obviously offset the um, the operating costs of of processing that material. Uh, and so, you know, there's 540,000 ounces, but there's also some 300,000 ounces of this lower grade material there that um, technically you would call waste because you've used a point A cutoff, but it actually is um, more than likely economic as well. Now, I just mentioned earlier, we have just completed some metallurgical test work. In fact, our share price has had a bit of a run today on the back of the, uh, those results released yesterday. And what was came out of that, which was really reassuring, is um, it's a, a very vanilla uh, process. The last thing someone wants is complexities in the metallurgical processing. And uh, this is about as vanilla as it can get. So um, that's very um, comforting, very reassuring that it's a simple crush, grind, cyanide, leaching and absorption process, um, a process that's been um, put in place thousands of times, hundreds of times, thousands of times around the world for, for decades. So very reassuring from that perspective. Next slide, please. So this is the Miraflores project. This is the one that's more advanced. It's about 800 metres away from Tesserito. Uh, you can see the economic metrics from that reserve from 2017 there. I think what's worth pointing out here is that at 1400 US dollars an ounce, so not today's gold price, but at 1400 and using an 8% discount on the NPV, so a relatively conservative uh, discount rate there, it's running at about 90 million uh, NPV. And that's on a capex of about $72 million in 2017 prices. And you can see the all-in sustaining cost there as well. So it's a nice little project. It's, it's sort of 40,000 ounces per annum type production. So it's not, it's not huge, but um, it's, a, it's a nice little learner. And um, you also have to factor in that 800 metres away is uh, Tesserito. Now, Miraflores is going through um, final um, drafting of submissions for the, um, for the EIA, which is the last step in getting approvals tomorrow at, um, at Miraflores, if we chose to do so. Uh, next slide, please. So this is our project pipeline. And this is another thing that I think is quite unique for, um, for Los Cerros. Uh, we do have a classic uh, project pipeline. We've got Miraflores there sitting in, um, in reserve status and, and, as I mentioned, going through final um, submissions. That, uh, combined with Tesserito and Dos Cabradas, leads to the Kinchia Project Preliminary Economic Assessment, which is essentially started with the, the fact that we're doing the metallurgy on Tesserito, and it'll be a focus for, for um, the second half of 2022. But sitting behind that in this project pipeline is a great number of uh, other targets that uh, we hope to see you know, get attention. Uh, Clara, Sebal, Chuskal are all part of that Kinchia area. Uh, and the, uh, the yellow ones you can see there are, are the um, Andes portfolio. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is our ESG slide, and you can see uh, lots of um, great numbers there. We have a very strong ESG focus. Um, I think the most important one is the one I raised earlier, that essentially everyone in the company is Colombian, and most of them live in Kinchia which means we're very much part of the local community and part of the, um, part of the local economy. And that, that puts us in very good um, standing with the, with the local communities. Uh, next slide, please. 
So in summary, uh, we're in a prime location. We're in the mid Kolka Porphyry Belt, which already hosts many multi-million ounce discoveries. Uh, strong cash position, some 14 million in cash at the moment. Uh, we've got the advanced project at Kinchia, which does have a reserve, but um, also has Tesserito as an inferred resource at 1.3 million ounces for a total of 2.6 million ounces at a gram per tonne. The metallurgy, um, I've released the, the, the bulk of the metallurgical results yesterday, but there's still a few more bits and pieces to come through on the on silver recoveries and various other bits and pieces. And that will feed into the PEA. We have a strong ESG focus, um, uh, and I, I look forward to talking more about that in, uh, in coming months as we have a few projects on the ESG front that uh, are getting some steam behind them. And a very experienced uh, board and a very strong uh, local team. And that's essentially it. Thank you, Jason. We've got uh, quite a few questions coming through <laughs> here, probably, probably through uh, from a, quite astute investors, I suggest. Um, yeah. So can you talk through the, there's a change of government, I believe. Can you talk through the implications of a new government for this project? Yeah. Um, so uh, President-elect Petro, uh, he comes into power in, in August. So the elections were last month and he comes into power in August. He, um, his views as sort of communicated through the uh, election campaign are very heavily focused on environment, on ESG, which is, you know, that's a contemporary view that most leaders have, uh, and on uh, lifting the um, living status, living quality of, of the most um, uh, disadvantaged of, of the Colombian community. So that's, that's the, the focus he has. And in terms of uh, Los Cerros, I think our credentials on all three of those things is, is pretty strong. Uh, we are um, very contemporary, if not leading, on some of our ESG initiatives in the local area. And uh, we have obviously have a very strong environmental focus and the fact that we are essentially entirely Colombian and uh, employ a lot of local people, particularly out of, out of difficult um, industries like artisanal mining and those sorts of things, puts us in a pretty good standing from that position. Uh, but, you know, of course, he has, um, he has a very strong environmental focus. Um, I think there's lots of people paraphrasing each other at the moment on limited um, knowledge of what um, President-elect Petro's government is going to be and, and how he's going to work with the Congress. Uh, I think at this moment, even though it doesn't really leave some concerns out there, some ambiguity out there, it's really a case that we just need some uh, time to see how Petro balances the, um, the, the various priorities he's placed on his uh, government for the next four years. In terms of us immediately, um, there, there are sort of three things that we're focused on at the moment. One is finishing the Miraflores um, studies and, and submissions, because that is an underground operation and, and relatively small scale, but also moving on this bigger Tesserito story. Uh, and developing that side as well, which means also doing the, the PEA and those sorts of things to essentially de-risk um, the more advanced assets that we have in the company. And and um, just on those Miraflora results, what's what's the significance and what's the read through on the on the Miraflora results? Yeah, just the there's a question here on the recent drill results. Uh, uh, oh, okay, on on the exploration results, I see. Um, yeah. Yeah, so what that has told us, and this is an announcement that we put out to the market a few weeks ago, I think that's what the question is about. Uh, essentially, what that has told us is that Tesserito and Miraflores, yes, they're 800 metres apart, and they probably are part of, of one system at depth. Uh, the, the shallower material that we drilled through in, in recent programs didn't hit anything um, economically exciting between the two. Uh, perhaps there is connections between the two at uh, depth, but where we drilled through, there wasn't particularly anything compelling there. But what it did do, and this is um, quite interesting, is it actually continued drilling past that zone between Miraflores and Tesserito and went under Miraflores. And we hit Breccia, which is the, 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 um, the unit that hosts the Miraflores gold. Uh, we hit that at great depth, uh, and uh, that raised the opportunity or the possibility or, or ask the question, does Miraflores continue considerably beyond the bottom of the existing defined um, reserve envelopes? And uh, we're testing that right now with a, with a drill hole as we speak. And there's just another question here, kind of what, what's the, the focus for the next uh, one to five years? The area sure, of focus? yeah. So at the moment, the focus, given that we've got you know, some obviously difficult markets for juniors out there, 
is to uh, ramp or sort of dial down the, the speculative activity, the, the early stage uh, exploration, and focus on building um, robust numbers around our existing assets. So that means advancing Miraflores. It means um, doing the metallurgy and the PEA on, on Tesserito and those sorts of things. And then getting into the, the, the PEA proper for the whole of King Chia. And what that um, I suspect will tell us in the early parts of that PEA is um, which of the numerous options we have we should focus on. And to be, be brief, but to cover those options, there are essentially three pathways and the number of hybrids between those pathways. But the three pathways are, do we, do we focus on Miraflores, the underground operation, the, the small scale operation that is DFS stage? Do we focus on that? Or do we focus on that slightly larger scenario, or significantly larger scenario really, uh, of Tesserito and Miraflores put together, that starter pit of Tesserito and Miraflores put together and develop that story? Or do we go all out and build uh, and design a project for the 2.6 million ounces we already have and, and who knows how much else we'll find in coming years. So in terms of the pathway, the, the first step is to explore those options and then select from that the subset that we should advance further over coming years. And I must say, there's a couple of questions here that are exactly on that topic. And I just want to make sure we've, we'll get to them. I had to put my glasses on, it's a bit hard to read. Um, what will be the next exploration target? Any priority targets going back to Miraflores um, and others? or the um, pink blob between Miraflores and Tesserito? Yeah, the pink blob is the one I was talking about before, so I think I've, I've gotcha. covered that. Um, no, look, I, I think uh, we, we are conducting a geological review uh, right now, so we're looking at all the data because obviously it's moved on dramatically over the last two years with um, five rigs running continuously 24 hours a day for two years. So uh, lots of data to assimilate. Uh, if you ask me personally where I think the exciting targets sit right now, I think Sebal and, and, um, and, and Chuskal um, look, uh, have not been explained, I guess is the best way of putting that. There's fantastic smoke in, in the drilling results and the surface footprint is, is quite exciting, but we haven't actually explained why they're there. We haven't found the cause of the porphyry in either of those and they're particularly compelling. But really, it's, they're compelling to me because we haven't done the same in-depth exercise of the five or six other targets that we have in the area, they might be equally compelling once we've done this geological review. And, and kind of news flow moving forward, what, what can shareholders expect? Yeah, uh, so we put out the MET results yesterday. Uh, now, as I've said in that announcement, the, um, the next steps on that is to progress that further. So we have more metallurgy to do and then that will feed into the PEA. And in the background, we have dialed it down, but in the background, we have exploration running. So there'll be exploration news flow as well. Jason, that's all we have time for. Nice to have you back on uh, Hidden Gems webinar. Have a good weekend and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, everyone. That's all we have time for. Have a nice weekend. The sun's out, thank God. See you next week.